Hello everyone, I'm Sarah Ellsworth Hoffman and welcome to this week's edition of a brand new show called The Goldie Show. Our host Goldie firmly believes that everyday people are worth more than gold. There are many encouraging stories from people in our community that frankly don't get told. We want The Goldie Show to be a place that we can showcase stories of good people and organizations who are making a difference in our community in a positive way. We hope that the show will encourage, inspire, and motivate you. We will bring you guests from all walks of life, and as you watch The Goldie Show, we hope that you will connect with and learn from our guests. Today, Goldie's guest is a multi-talented producer, arranger, and recording engineer from New Haven. Many of our viewers may be familiar with John Gillespie, who also happens to be an audio technology consultant and salesperson at Sweetwater Sound. John also has a home-based studio called The Cloister. We recently took our cameras to The Cloister, where Goldie met up with today's guest, John Gillespie. Hi, welcome to Goldie Show. I have John Gillespie over here with me, and I'll be talking with him and find out what all he's all about. Hi, John. How are you? Uh, good. Well, I know from what research I've done about you, you're not from Fort Wayne originally. Correct. And could you tell us where you are from? I grew up in uh, Minnesota, small town, 832 people, and uh, then moved to the Chicago area when I, where I went to college and lived there for eight years, and then moved to Fort Wayne area in 1989. All in throughout the school, did you ever do music, composition, or drama, or stage, or any kind of a thing? All of that. All of that. that. I was, um, I started playing piano before I have any memory of it. Um, my parents said I was picking out melodies by ear on the piano before I could talk. So, um, I've just always been doing it and always been fascinated with music. And then in high school, I did school musicals and I was in the band and I would write arrangements for the band and they would play them and you know the high school band and that kind of thing. And through all, all your journey of school and college and all, do you have any kind of a person in your life that really inspired you to you know go on or challenge you with all this? Wow, yeah, uh, a few. Did it? Um, my parents were both very musical and encouraged that and then um, I had two great high school band directors, Mr. Hahn and Mr. Keene. They were both awesome, and they're both still around. I keep in touch with them every now and then. Hi, guys. So they're probably not watching. But, uh, you know, and in college, I had some great uh, professors. The dean of the conservatory was very encouraging to me. And, and But really, it's always been almost an unhealthy obsession for me, so... So you, you also, I know you say you produce music, you write music. Yeah. Um, I was a composition major at the conservatory and concentrated on ethnomusicology. So I've always kind of been drawn to world music. Now, with all this music background and all, do you always try to even teach anybody or it's just, you know? Oh. Yeah. I, I think that... Um, that's a big part of my personality. When I have people that are in the studio, I don't try to keep my secrets. Some engineers, you know, when they're in the studio, they, they don't want to tell people what kind of equipment they use or what they're doing, but I'm always just going, well, now I'm going to do this and try, try this. Check. Do you like what this is? You know, and I explain maybe too much sometimes. So. But you're not selfish about it. That's no, what you're trying I, to tell Well, me. yeah, no, I, I just want to share and... I, a long time ago, I think I'd, one of the greatest blessings in my life was that I kind of, it occurred to me what my reason for being on the planet was. And that was to encourage people to grow as human beings, emotionally, spiritually, and intellectually, by helping them discover the creative potential that was within them. So running a studio for many years was the perfect job for that. So when all through all this journey and I are you married? You have yeah. kids? I'm married and have one little daughter who's beautiful who was born uh, two weeks before I turned fifty. Oh wow. So <laughs> and she's almost two now. So Well that's you good. Can do the I math. mean I we <laughs> yes, Matt. 
you know, age is just a number, they say. Mm. Am I right? No. No. Absolutely not. Oh, absolutely not. Okay. <laughs> and I know, you, you know, you uh, worked after you got out of college, you had your music, your composition. Did you find job immediately? Was it challenging or... Um. I did relatively menial tasks for a while, you know, stupid, worked in a part store and, and was a janitor for a little while. And then uh, I moved to Fort Wayne in 1989, and the first thing I did was I looked up all the recording studios, because uh -huh. I had done my graduate work in uh, recording. And uh, so I called up Sweetwater, interviewed with Chuck Surak for like an hour and a half, and then oh, wow. he said, you know, if I'd have got your resume one day earlier, I would have hired you, but I just hired this other guy, oh. so I can't. <laughs> but I've been friends with Chuck ever since, too, at Sweetwater, so now I'm working there. I, okay, wonderful, you know, congratulations. All, after all these years later. So. But did you do any odd jobs before all well, that? I mean, <laughs> to be honest. When I when I wasn't uh, when I when I couldn't get in into any studios in Fort Wayne, this was 1989. Um, I would drive by the zoo. I lived pretty close to the zoo, <laughs> so I just I stopped in there one day, and so I had this resume it was all about all the equipment and music stuff I knew how to use, and I handed him my resume. And at the end, it, it was like other interests enjoys animals. So I thought, what the heck? And I got the job. So I worked as a zookeeper at the Fort Wayne Children's Zoo for 10 years. The thing about doing um, work like a zookeeper or a janitor or anything like that is, um, well, I know of an old Zen master mm -hmm. who said, you know, if you want to, um, if you want to get good at what you're doing, uh, chop wood and haul water. Oh, wow. So manual labor tasks provided me an opportunity to um, free my mind and allow creativity to just be flowing while I was doing things like, you know, sweeping a kangaroo barn or, you know, okay, carrying food to the animals and that kind of thing. So. But did that frustrate you because you have so much knowledge of music and composition and being a composer to work in a zoo? Did that at point get you to a point of, you know, what am I doing here? I've got music background and I'm here sweeping and stuff. And <laughs> well, I, I maybe a tiny bit. Um, I've always been very committed to my art, but. I guess everything in its time and place. And I always knew that I would eventually be doing something musical full time, and I have been for decades. So, so how long it took you to put all this together? The studio? Well, I'll yeah. let you know when I'm done. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, your the studio itself. I I decided to start in 1992. Wow. And. Um, I got a second job and I just worked and saved money and lived as cheaply as I could. Lived in a crappy apartment, and, you know, <laughs> terrible. And I just kept working and buying equipment and putting it, trying to make the stuff that I had better and better and make my skills better and better to the point where, you know, I've recorded a lot of national artists at this point and, you know. With all this knowledge that you have, what is your message out to the younger generations or people who are trying to get into your shoes or where you have been and where you are today? Mm. What is your message? Absolute commitment um, to your dream. Sacrifice. Well, yeah, I mean, that's part of it. So, I mean, if you're committed, you don't even think about sacrifice. You just, so I'm doing this, you know. Blinders on, kind of, you know. It, like the horse race. Yeah, right. And you know, people talk about having a balanced life. You mm -hmm. can't, you can't be really good at something and have a balanced life. It's impossible. <laughs> you can't. Screw balance. You know, <laughs> get good at something. Get good at what you love. Um, now, 
it seems to me, and I, maybe this has always been true and I didn't understand it when I was a kid, mm. but it just seems to me that now there's a generation in our country that feels like everything should be just handed to them. I like, I worked my butt off to get this stuff, and I still am working my butt off to get this stuff. I, I always think there's of the next really amazing piece of equipment that I can get that'll make me, help me be better. So there's a difference in generations, you're trying to tell me. What about the music? Maybe. Have you seen difference in music from oh. what you were a couple, couple, couple years ago than now? What, I mean, is there a gap, there's a difference, or is it the same? You know, it's kind of funny. Um, mm -hmm. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a musician about, and I said something about, you know, I mean, I, I know, I understand how to make hip hop sound right, rap, that kind of stuff, but I don't really enjoy it. You know, I know how to make it sound right, but I don't listen to it. The guy is named Michael Patterson, a great jazz bass player, really a, an amazing person. And he said, well, it's not for you. <laughs> it's like, it's not, it's, it's for, you know, the people that listen to us for this generation. And, and I started thinking about it. You know, in my day, um, there was Led Zeppelin and ACDC that would have double entendre in their music, you know, and, uh, adults would be shocked and think it was satanic. And, you know, I look at now, you know, some of the lyrics that I hear in modern hip hop and R and B are like, oh my gosh, how misogynistic and how how uh it it seems like the lyrics are designed to do nothing but shock. And and you know, that was true twenty five years ago, thirty years ago. That was true in the fifties and the sixties. It you know, uh it just gets a little more extreme because it takes more to shock people. <laughs> I hope you're enjoying Goldie's interview with John Gillespie. In case you just tuned in, I'm Sarah Ellsworth Hoffman and you're watching a brand new program called The Goldie Show. The Goldie Show is a half hour treat with our host Goldie, interviewing folks from different walks of life who are making a positive difference in our community. You can see The Goldie Show every Thursday afternoon at one o'clock. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and also on our website, goldieshow.com. Now let's go back to Goldie and her recent interview with the multi-talented producer, arranger, and composer, John Gillespie, where he rejoins us to talk about his current work, including work he's done with some famous artists. He will also be discussing his thoughts on going for your dreams. I know you've got a lot of things going on, a lot of projects going on. What, what do you think about your future? I mean, where do you want this to go? Hmm. Where do you want your music to go? Or what is your plan? If a, a singer is trying to get a record deal as a pop singer and she's 23 years old, mm -hmm. she's considered too old in the modern industry. Again, it's the age, the it's number. The, yeah, but so I know that I'm not going to be, you know, it, it's funny because in order to get good at something, you can't be really good at something when you're 22, 23 years old, you know? You've got to develop your craft. And I feel like I'm still coming, you know, I'm still improving every day you're as learning. I work on it. You're learning. Yeah, always. You, every day. You stop learning, you start dying. So I'm always learning and getting better, but I know I'm never going to be in the front of the camera. I'm never going to be the rock star. So the project I've been working on now for the past 14 years, um, I find singers, and most of them are young, attractive singers that um, sing, that are familiar with other cultures. Um, several different African countries, um, lots of different Asian countries, um, different countries of Europe, different cultures, and also different ethnic styles in the United States. I still haven't found any South American singers, so any Brazilians or Chileans out there, give me a call, we'll get you, your album started. <laughs> but um, I'm always looking for new singers, and what I do is I record 
the traditional songs from those cultures um, in, I re record them a cappella with just a, a pitch reference and a metronome so they get the tempo and the key consistent. And then once they've recorded these traditional songs, mm -hmm. I uh, kind of arrange them and, and, and create an instrumental setting. I, I, I've had friends call it uh, reimagining. I reimagine these traditional songs and make them into something new, but yet preserving the essence of the tradition. But you have a well-fed, you know, studio over here. Now, do you bring people over here to record? So, usually, usually. Um, uh. I'm working with some singers that are um, around the world. I have a singer in Korea that sometimes records and sends me his vocals, and I'm working very heavily with a singer in um, Arizona right now who are, who's doing Catalan uh, folk songs from, from the Catalonia region of Spain. And I have a drummer in Uganda that I use a lot, and a friend in Japan that does tracks for me and sends me, you know. Different languages also you work yes, with them. Yeah, almost. I mean, I, I have a Celtic album that's generally in English when it's not in Welsh or Irish, you know. And uh, there's an American hymns album, and I'm working on one of um, old blues songs, and I'm also working on one from Jamaica and of planning one in from uh Canada but those are and those would be English speaking but then I've got one in German uh working on one in French one in Latin uh Greek uh Philippines wow uh Japan China um Liberia Africa Uganda it's basically yeah. most all over the world all over the world I know you said you've done music and all, and you've done a lot of stuff. Have you ever worked with any of the famous, you know, like either director, actor? Mostly some famous musicians. Mm -hmm. um, probably currently the most famous person I've worked with is a rapper named, uh, that calls himself Gucci Mane. Gucci Mane. Gucci Mane. Hmm. Not Gucci Man, but Gucci, Gucci Mane. Gucci Mane. Yeah, that was okay. so funny. I got this phone call, and... When I was doing the studio full-time and advertising all over the place, I would get kids that would call in all the time and say they were, you know, Beyonce or whatever. You know, the, the kids would mess with me. What was your reaction? Oh, I, you know, I always knew that it wasn't real. And but would you play along? Yeah, with yeah, I would, but, <laughs> you know. So I get this call, and this guy is just mumbling on the phone. I couldn't understand what he said, and I kept going what? What are you saying? And then finally he, he handed the phone to somebody else. He said, yeah, I'm, I'm Gucci Mane's manager and he's on this tour right now and he wants to do recording a, a song in every city that he does a stop on his tour in. And we asked around and heard that your studio was the place to go. And, and I'm thinking, first of all, I don't know who Gucci Mane is. So, um, I said, what? He said, I said, when do you want to come in? They said, tonight. Okay. I said, no, I'm booked tonight. Okay. And they said, uh, well, what do you charge? And I said, $50 an hour. And they said, cancel your session, we'll pay you double. <laughs> and I'm You're like, like, really? Right. Mm. Okay, when are you coming? They said, 8 o'clock. Okay, right. <laughs> um, so I just hung up. And I thought, well, whatever, you know. And all of a sudden, all the hip-hop producers from town started calling me and going, what time's Gucci getting there? And I'm like, come on, are you guys all in on this? What's the deal? They're like, no, this is real. So I called my session that night, and I'm like, I think I have to cancel. And they're like, okay, whatever, we'll do it next week. And, yeah, sure enough, the guy came in, and he had, um, he had his DJ, and his manager and several armed bodyguards, which he posted at the door outside the studio, standing there with their big guns. And <laughs> it you was like... it was a weird evening, uh, but yeah, we recorded a song, and a lot of the kids know the song. Although this is a show that 
is on television, so I can't say the name of the song. Okay, that's right. That was my next question. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what the song name is? But East Atlanta N Word. Okay. The, okay. The, the that, name of the yeah, song. That, yeah. Then so. we'll leave it at that. <laughs> that okay. Yeah. I know you have another person that does recording in your studio. His name is Cheeto. Cheeto. Cheeto Zilio. Yeah. He's um uh a uh, very positive rapper, Christian rapper from Nigeria. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, he's I've, I've worked with Cheeto for years. And uh, he's even sung a, uh, a Nigerian song for, for my project. Well, wonderful. Yeah. Uh, hopefully I will have the honor of interviewing him too. And uh, going on further, I was just, you know, we talked about, yeah, you have a daughter. Would you like her to follow your footsteps? Sure. If... if I want her to follow her heart. Uh -huh. and But I can, you know, of course, as a musician myself, I want her to to experience the joy and the intense passion that I have. Of course, passion means suffering, really. <laughs> but um, but there's a joy in that suffering. And uh, she, I can tell she really strongly relates to music, because I do, you know. And so I think she will in some sense or another. I, uh, and, you know, I know you have a studio here, but you have a family life, you have a studio, and you work at Sweetwater, correct? Yes, I do. Yeah. How do you juggle your life between A, B, and C? I don't sleep. You oh. sleepwalk? <laughs> just about. <Do> you... <laughs> just about. I don't just work on my own music here. I work with a lot of clients, and um, uh, there have been people that have been recording with me for many years. I stopped advertising, and I stopped taking new clients, but I still am working with people that I've been working with for 10 or 15 years, and regularly. So that's a big part of my income. You're, you are a very positive thinker. You take negative and make it into a positive, well, you course. know. And music is kind of a thing that just suits you sometimes. When you, when you cannot achieve what you're achieving, trying to achieve, what do you do with your frustration? You know, sometimes you say, okay, I'm going to get this music here, but this, uh, nah, do you like forget it? I'm gonna stop here and start all over, or you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah, um, I keep going until I do. So you don't give up. That's what you do. Well, absolutely, giving up. We don't. Have... It's a foreign concept to me. <laughs> 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 giving up? What? Like I'm working with this singer in Arizona I mentioned, and and she um. She has a really keen sense of what should happen in the music. And usually, my singers that I work with will sing the song, and then they go away, <laughs> and I do it, you know, and I give them the song, and they go, that's cool, like, great, but this one, <laughs> kind she's of a tug like, of war? not a tug of war, it's like uh, iron sharpens iron, as the <laughs> Bible says, you know, it's like, we, yeah, we, we, I respect her, and she respects, our, you know, we both have very good... Uh, respect for each other's abilities and, and um, her ear is very keen and she'll say like the song I've been working on she said um, man it's almost there but it could really use a taiko drum part and I'm like okay <laughs> alrighty I can see that let me try it so I came home that night and pulled up some samples of taiko drums and played this groove and put it in there where she said she thought it should be. And it's like, yeah, I can see that. So I sent it to her. She's like, uh, no, this isn't right. I said, you know, what's wrong with it? <laughs> she said, well, it, it's too much the same groove. And you should watch, she said, you should watch some videos, YouTube videos of taiko ensemble. So I did. And it's like, Oh, yeah, okay, let me do this. And she was like, oh, I, I can tell you're frustrated. You can stop. And I'm like, no, 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 no. I got it now. <laughs> so the, a couple of days later, I played the part again, and I played it like 20 times until I felt like I got it sounding like a real taiko ensemble. And I sent it to her, and she's like, that's great. That's what I wanted. Oh, but this one part. <laughs> like, okay. But at that point, you know, I realized her vision is really sharp and when I pay attention to what she says 
it makes it better. It all comes together, no yeah. matter what. You know, yeah. compromise is there, the thoughts are there, everything is there. I don't really even see it as compromise. I see it as improvement. That's we wonderful. each improve each other. You know, and all with all this, you know, knowledge, the music, everything you got. What is one message that you can tell the audience? One strong message Just that can impact. Go for it. Make yourself better. You know, if you're trying to achieve a goal, you if you want to be a famous singer and you're 18 years old and you're still young enough to do it, <laughs> you know, keep singing. And if, 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 if they tell you you're not good enough, don't say it. Oh, what if I'm they're not quit. 18? What if they're well, not 18? What if they're 30? What if they're 40? Find a way that you can you know? still do it. I mean, there's lots of ways that people can make their living doing music. They don't have to be a pop star, you know. There's, man, if you sing jazz, you can do it until you're 90. Your messages do not give Just up. Just don't quit. Don't let it be part of your mental vocabulary. Don't give up. Yeah. Keep on going. Yeah, that, what you said. John, to be honest, today has been a great inspiration. You have inspired me. Cool. That's what I'm here for. I know. But it, I really do thank you for your time. Sure. And the passion that you have for music, I can feel it. I can sense it. You really have so much knowledge. And you can speak about music. And when you speak, you speak from your heart. And for me... It has been a great inspiration, and I do thank you very, very much to be on my show. It's a great honor. So much to come and sing. <laughs> you want me to come and sing? Okay. Thank you so, so sure. much. It is a great honor. I do thank you all audience out there who watched my show. Everyday people are worth more than gold. And we will see you till next time. Thank you once again. Good afternoon. That wraps up this week's edition of The Goldie Show. You won't want to miss next week when Goldie will interview local Christian rap artist Cheeto Azilo. Check out The Goldie Show here every Thursday afternoon at 1 o'clock. The Goldie Show, where we believe that everyday people are worth more than gold. I'm Sarah Ellsworth Hoffman. See you soon.